So good evening. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizers for this uh, session. I think that the internationalization of higher education is one of the most significant changes that we're seeing within higher education systems globally. Um, and it introduces some really important topics of conversation for us. I think Gary started most of the, the, the points that I have, so I'm just going to carry on with them. Um, the phenomenon of internationalization uh, as it relates to in higher education refers to an evolving and somewhat confusing term that is often used to talk about the many programmatic policy and structural changes being undertaken in institutions as they adjust to the new global knowledge-based economy. Uh, within these changes, the growth of student mobility is one of the most significant trends and factors impacting universities and colleges. To begin with, I'd like to share a little bit about myself and how I came to have a career in international education. In my early 20s, I had the opportunity to work in East Africa uh, with an international aid agency giving assistance to Ethiopian refugees fleeing their internal conflicts. Um, when I left a year later, I'm quite certain that the biggest changes brought about through my experience was to my own outlook and worldview. And I, I doubt that I made a really significant impact on the very complex refugee situation in the Sudan. The experience made me want to create new opportunities for others to have a similar paradigm shift and ultimately I found myself doing this by initiating and managing the student exchange and study abroad programs for the University of Manitoba. I'm no longer working with students but I continue to uh, believe that it is a very important cause as I work with faculty members such as those in David's unit um, to initiate and manage uh, international programs and projects. Um, so, to begin my part of tonight's discussion, I've chosen to focus on the motivations, the rationales, and the impacts of international student mobility at the national, institutional, and individual levels of higher education in Canada and in Manitoba. I'm strongly of the opinion that policy formation, while being informed by trending facts and figures, needs to take a critical stance towards the backstory, the why, as Gary said, and the how, as well as the what, when, and where. So I'll be looking at two distinct groups of mobile students. First, students um, from other countries coming to Canada and Manitoba to obtain their higher education degrees. Second, I'll look at Manitoba students who go out from our province to have an experience abroad as part of their University of Manitoba degree programs. The context and impact of these two groups are quite different from each other but, and need to be dealt with quite separately, but there are some interesting and useful comparisons between them. So I thought I'd deal with them together. Uh, Gary mentioned some of the, the provincial statistics, but when we look at international students, student mobility trends globally, the vast majority of the more than four and a half million uh, students currently studying outside of their home countries are students registered in degree programs. The majority of these students are leaving countries in the so-called global south and entering universities and colleges in the global north particularly from Asia to English-speaking countries of the US, UK, Australia, and Canada. Though some non-English universities in France and Germany also rank among the highest enrollments of international students. Um, about 8% of post-secondary enrollment in Canada is comprised of international students in Canadian degree programs. At the University of Manitoba, our international student enrollment is above the national average at 13%. And break this down further to note that international students form 14% of undergraduate student enrollment at the U of M and over 25% of graduate student enrollment. That's as of fall of 2013. So why are students leaving their countries to pursue post-secondary degrees in Canada and other OECD countries? Um, higher education scholars studying this trend have noticed uh, several rationales among international students that are actually quite similar to rationals for our domestic students. They want to gain knowledge and skills that will enable them to succeed in their career. However, there's more to it than this. They particularly want a degree from a Canadian or other Western country which is perceived uh, to be more desirable or better quality, uh, prestige than other universities in their home country. Gary talked about this a bit. And if possible, many of these international students have an objective of emigrating to their host country in order to build a better life for themselves and their family. Again, introducing the question of um, how does it relate to immigration policy. 
This is increasingly made possible by growing market economies in these uh, countries that were formerly considered to be quote unquote developing nations and the increase in personal wealth among many in these countries. Countries like Canada are also offering attractive immigration incentives, uh, as was discussed at a Cathay Polytechnique just earlier this winter. What about governments of the countries from which these students originate? Are they concerned by the exodus of their best and brightest young people who are pursuing studies abroad? Well, contrary to how such trends might be perceived should Canadian students be resettling abroad in similar numbers, Many foreign governments are actually supporting and encouraging their student population to obtain post-secondary degrees in countries like Canada. An increasing number of foreign governments are establishing ambitious scholarship programs uh, for citizens of their country to study abroad. At least a dozen such programs currently exist. Brazil, China, Mexico, Saudi Arabia are some of the largest ones. More are likely to come. These programs uh, vary in the amount of their overall investment in time. Uh, but their existence is informative for us. In particular, it presents a significant source of external financing for host universities in Canada. While foreign government scholarship programs are relatively a new, new addition in international student mobility trends and are currently being studied, at least two rationales for such uh, programs have been proposed. First, governments are investing in the acquisition of knowledge and skills in select areas of needed expertise for growing their economic development of their country. Second, by having experts and professionals trained abroad, governments are expecting to improve and strengthen the government and higher education infrastructure of their own country through the repatriation of the foreign trained graduates. The risk of brain drain through permanent emigration of graduates to their host country is real but the growing number of such funding programs suggests that foreign governments consider the beneficial impacts to outweigh the risks. The impact of degree-seeking international students in Canada is significant. First, these students do bring, as Gary mentioned, a tremendous economic benefit to Canadian universities and colleges at a time when government spending on higher education is static or declining. In 2010, Canada's uh, the Canadian government's economic impact reform, uh, sorry, impact report, affirms that international students contribute $8 billion annually to Canada's economy. At the U of M in 2013-14, differential fees and direct revenue from pathway programs alone contributed nearly $5 million or 1% to the University of Manitoba's operating budget. So it's something significant that we need to pay attention to. At the institutional level, the impact of international students on campus goes well beyond the financial aspects. Greater ethnic and cultural diversity in our classrooms provides opportunities for all students to learn new perspectives and sharpens the quality of educational programs through increasing competition for talent. At the graduate level, students often form the research links to universities in their home countries, contributing to the expansion of research in Canadian universities while at the same time lowering the cost through the acquisition of scholarships from foreign governments. Not all impacts are positive, however. Faculty members must learn new cultural skills in order to, to teach effectively in these newly diverse environments. And additional staff resources are, are required to support the needs of international students. Professional degree programs with limited enrollment caps complain about international students crowding up domestic students, increasing competition with, based on GPA entrance re, uh, requirements post-graduation job opportunities. These are significant concerns and need to be addressed in a policy dialogue. So I would echo uh, John McHale's question, what does Canada hope to accomplish through the recruitment of foreign students? And I hope we can discuss that. In my remaining minutes, I would like to turn to universe, Canadian university students and the trends concerning mobility of our own students studying abroad. According to a recently completed national survey conducted by the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada in 2014, 3.1% of Canadian post-secondary students study abroad as part of their degree program. This statistic is virtually unchanged from 2006, a similar survey. And the national average lags well behind other OECD countries. Germany boasts a study abroad rate of 30%. EU overall is uh, aiming for 20% in 2020. The US and the UK have study abroad rates of 10% and 6% uh, respectively. And I'm sorry to say, but participation rates 
at the University of Manitoba are only half of the Canadian average, at 1.5%. As a country and as a province, we need to address some important and challenging questions regarding our own students' participation rate in international study opportunities. I'd like to briefly review some of the primary motivations and rationales for establishing study abroad programs. To begin, I need to clarify that study abroad encompasses a wide range of, of possible opportunities, including practicums and placements, some of the things that David talked about. Um, and they can range in length of time. There are a number of point, important reasons why many educators consider international learning opportunities to enhance the quality of education. One of the most commonly stated rationales is to improve students' awareness and knowledge of the, of the world in order to, to develop so-called so soft skills and cultural competence, and it, that improves their employability rates post-graduation. Uh, a close corollary to this is for students to develop a sense of global responsibility and citizenship, to know their place in the world and be prepared to be a positive contributor. I suppose I'm an example of that. Uh, the Canadian government's new international education strategy, released in 2012, talks about the diplomacy of knowledge and advocates for Canadian students to gain global perspectives that help to build trade with countries around the world. It suggests that international education for Canadian students helps to prepare a national labor force for the future and therefore is important for Canada's trade and economic development. The plan talks about target, a target of doubling Canadian student engagement abroad to 50,000, up from 25,000 by 2022. But to date, uh, no significant government in investment has been made. According to the AECC survey, Canadian universities all agree that about, about the value and importance of supporting programs to ensure graduates um, are prepared for successful engagement in the global labor market. U of M is no, ex no exception. However, while institutional values might underscore the priority of internationalization through study abroad, suitable financial incentives and supports are slow to emerge. Uh, investment, uh, sorry, study abroad, particularly at the undergraduate level, is largely self-financed. Students and their parents have shown willingness to invest personally in study abroad programs that relate directly to their degree requirements and their chosen career path. The challenge for universities and university instructors is to create such international opportunities that are meaningful and do not penalize students for going abroad. We need to do a better job of aligning credit transfers, recognizing and rewarding study abroad experience, and promoting the acquisition of international education as a valuable component of a Manitoba degree program. Um, I was going to close with a quick look at our international strategy. Do I have a minute? <laughs> I know, I'm getting waved at. <laughs> Our university has recently come up with a new international strategy where we're placing priorities on institutionalizing our internationalization efforts. The U of M strategy flows and aligns directly with our institutional strategic plan. International education programs and priorities are to contribute to the overall enhancement of academic quality. Um, at the U of M with intentionally established objectives and outcomes. We are working towards focusing our efforts on fewer, more established international partnerships uh, that will be evaluated by measurements related to overall purpose of the degree program requirements. The strategy is governed by an international advisory committee and draws from self-organized regional advisory groups within the university, supported by an operations committee of administrative staff and support units. Through this governance structure, we hope to include a grassroots voice of faculty and staff and students um, and secure the support of senior decision makers to ensure that international mobility trends are successfully addressing the significant priorities and challenges for our university and our province's place in the global knowledge-based economy. Time will tell if we are successful, but I am convinced that we can only do this if, as a higher education sector, we are doing this cooperatively, cohesively with the support of our community. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rhonda.